Well, everyone, welcome back to another Immigration Nation. This is Mark Holthy, Canadian immigration lawyer, and I'm here with my special guest, Will Tao. Welcome, Will. Great to have the man, the myth, the legend in the house again. How are you? Good, good. Glad to be back. Love the intro. I was jamming uh, out there, uh, but your correspondent <laughs> is back with more news, so I'm happy to be here. Very cool. So this is kind of round three of the whole, you know, AI kind of, uh, you know, um, this whole assessment process that IRCC is undertaking to deal with these massive, awful, you know, backlogs and trying to deal with the massive volumes. And so this is, yeah, this is uh, the latest rendition in that series of three. And right now we're talking about um, uh, some latest details that you've been able to extract in your efforts to pull back the current. And uh, yeah, so right now this new, you know, this new augmented assessments that immigration is looking at, uh, you talk a little bit about the fact that it might displace Chinook. So mm -hmm. why don't we dive in and just give a little bit of background for our viewers if this is the first video they're watching. So tell us a little bit about where this all started. Yeah, well, definitely go watch the first two episodes on Chinook. I think it's like part one, part two, um, where we really delve into what Chinook is. But Chinook is an automated immigration decision uh, program used by IRCC. They call it an Excel-based tool. It's probably cloud now but they utilize it to be able to process on bulk applications. And my theory of the case now is that Chinook, uh, we know it's on its way out because the government has been emailing about this and we know about uh, some of those things that are in, in the works, but how the artificial intelligence and advanced analytics system integrate with uh, some of this Chinook processing is going to be the future. And that's what I think is exciting. and. I'm looking forward to breaking it down with your audience today. Absolutely. So you can see streamed eight months ago, why your visa application was refused. That was the first introduction to Chinook. Then we did an update and now we're shifting gears. So that's where we are right now. So those of you who want to get caught up, absolutely head back, join the other 13,000. Or did you see this one? Well, 22,000 views. Hey, I think it's a popular topic. And I think this one is going to be just as popular. So yes, this is a live Q&A today and, uh, Will and, and I will give some time at the end, but Will's going to give a little update on where the world of immigration processing is at, at least as far as we know it right now. And if you have questions, we're going to confine them to the discussion of processing of the, the use of this artificial intelligence and, uh, and so focus on that. So if I don't answer your question and we skip through it, that's why. All right, Will, I'll turn it over. Give us, continue on a little bit further with this world. Yeah, so what's interesting about this world is it's it's new information to us, but it's not to the department. So this actually, you know, 2018 is when the, the bulk of the stuff we're learning is actually sourced from. So for them, it's been four years. For us, it's been maybe a few months. But we're learning about how they actually process applications utilizing advanced analytics. They started a pilot in China with their temporary resident visas. That pilot is also in India, we know, with their temporary resident visas. We know that study permits from China and India are also utilizing this. And then we're seeing in emails the government being like, we want to expand this everywhere because this model works for us. It's efficient. We get more things processed. Okay, here's a question. Why are they so secretive? Like, what's the issue? Why are we only finding out now something that they've rolled out back in 2018? Like, what's the issue? Well, I think when, once you start introducing the world of advanced analytics and algorithms, uh, you start having so-called blueprints. And what they want to create is a bit of a black box around this. So it's not penetrable by those seeking to, you know, game the system, so to speak, or, or figure out what the codes are or what the, you know, right algorithms are to get around the system. And I think I'm playing a, a fine role because I, I don't believe in those things. I'm very anti-fraud in my approach, but at the same time, there's a level of transparency to ensure that we're not just taking the biased data from yesterday, the, the ones that have maintained the 80, 90% refusals for certain folks and just codifying it into tomorrow so that it can never be penetrated and that it'll always be the case for folks from a certain country or a certain demographic. And that's where, you know, I, I have concerns. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. A lot of sense. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So let me talk a bit now about the triage. I think this is a really good starting point. And I think we can bring up that first infographic okay. because it's really interesting to show how this system works and why they, why they love it, so to speak, right? Um, so we know the chart's a little bit hard to see, but I'll, I'll try to walk. Yeah, and maybe I'll jump in for a second, Will, because those of you who are having trouble seeing this, um, all you need to do, I'll just, oh boy, I've got so many screens going here. Let's see if we can keep this rolling. Go to Will's Vancouver Immigration blog and you can actually see the actual post and you can pull up a larger image of the chart, what we're talking about. So if you're struggling, you can find it right on the Vancouver Immigration blog and it's a closer look at how IRCC's officer and model rules advance analytics triage works. Wow, that's a mouthful. Okay. That's a lot of mouthfuls. A whole <laughs> new language. And again, I, I want to be, you know, put up the disclaimers early. I am not a data scientist. I am not an advanced analytics specialist. And there are more, much smarter people in the world who are doing this work. So it's almost like the two worlds are colliding where, you know, myself as a verbose immigration lawyer is now having to add to my vocabulary these words such as model rules, triage, production zone. But in, in an essence and in, in short, when an application goes into the system right now, at, at least for this TRV model, again, being expanded to other lines of business, officers rules take certain cases out for processing by the visa office. But a lot of the cases and most of the cases will actually go through what are called model rules. And what model rules do are they sort applications into tiers. So this whole yes, no, maybe category that I think, you know, whenever, since I've been starting, we've always talked about this with applications, like there's a yes application, there's a no application for sure. And there's a maybe in the gray area. Well, this is sort of your technological advanced analytics system that splits it into those three categories, right? So um, in terms of uh, tier one, those are the applications that are deemed low risk and that will automatically be considered eligible. So there's no officer that needs to be part of that. Based on a set of criteria, those applications go straight to admissibility review. If there's a you know high risk factor with the applications and there's a good chance of refusal, those go into tier three and those get the extra special uh, <laughs> treatment of pre-assessment, eligibility, and those are why those applications probably are delayed, right? Those are the ones yeah. that are probably taking a little bit longer. The tier two applications are the ones that don't fit any of the either tier one or tier three, that's one option, or they led they lead to the need for further review. Um, so they, you know, they're not they're the not perfect fit, so to speak. Uh, the baby pile, pile as I as I call them in my um, yeah. in my assessment. But this is really interesting because now, um, you know, a lot of the decision that decisions that are being made are really outside of our submissions, outside of our written materials. It's largely based on whether you're a single applicant or not, the country of your residence. Like we know those are the factors that they're looking at in tier one. So, you know, how does that change the way that we approach our work and how do applicants, you know, understand that it might not be because their representative didn't, you know, give it a hundred percent or because, you know, they could have made a strong argument. It could be a system behind the scenes that has directed the traffic a certain direction. Yeah. And I know even recently, well, we had a very disappointed client who had their study permit application refused. We hold 100% to the fact there was no error committed by our firm, but clients don't understand that. And they said, oh, there was a document that you should have included a mysterious document and the notes say that, um, but yet the document checklist didn't specifically ask for it. And so I gave the client their money back and that's how we do it in our firm. And, uh, but it was the first time we've ever had an application in this context actually refused will where we feel like there was a clear error. The client wasn't willing to go forward and challenge it, but in the end they were just, they just wanted to head a different direction. So it's an extremely volatile area to practice in as a, as a representative. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, you know, first of all, as practitioners, we have to normalize refusals because refusals will come through. If you're representing a client from a 60, 70, 80% refusal country, and then they fall under some other trigger for the tier, let's say they are, you know, married with kids, or if they are a mature student, or they're, you know, um, the last one left in their family, not in Canada, or, or you know, those various yeah. factors, 
these are the type of words and these are the type of things that are going to flag and trigger your application through various tiers and the approval rates between a tier one when you're in a high 90s type category versus a tier three when you're in like a 20 30 percent notwithstanding the visa office itself already you know there's going to be those discrepancies and how much of it is out in our control now moving forward and how much the system will decide is, is fascinating so i wanted to share with your viewers fascinating this and freaking everybody out is, is that... absolutely um and you know what's interesting too and maybe we can pull up the the second one and i'll walk through this the, the couple visuals because i think if they all kind of yeah, work together i can find number two here bear with me this might be a little ugly this transition oh that hey that's perfectly. not too bad that was smooth <laughs> one, wonderful transition so this is you know database decision making and i think that's sort of where the government is going because i think the idea being data is more objective than you know an applicant claiming in letters and writing sort of explanations and so forth the data historically will lead the data tomorrow you know with our latest intel but this idea of an exploration zone first where they test out the data create these models and then they push it to the production zone where there are established models and they score applications, right? And the idea that we're at, like applications are actually being scored against a model. Going back to that answer key thing that I keep talking about in this area, even with Chinook, it's like, yeah. there is an answer key. There is an ideal tier one application. There's a tier three application. And what is your application closer to and how does it fit? Um, and those things are not being decided by letters. Those things are not being decided by, unfortunately, the, 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 the number of submissions we put in. Those are being decided by your age, your gender, your marital status, your country of citizenship, your country of residence, things that, frankly, many of us can't control. So it's, a, it's an interesting world where we're heading into. All right. So these data, data mart, is that what we've got here? Existing data mart. This data, how are they collecting it, Will? And, and how are they coalescing it? How are they... You know, how are they combining it to, to create these models? Well, that's the stuff that I think sometimes we, we're probably going to eventually need a data scientist to come in and join one of our episodes. And let's see how much, like what they, what they make of like all they that. Like they just scrub but, the applications? Um, like do they, well, they just scrub of, the applications and the information that's put in there? Yeah. So what well, you're saying, Will, is that what you're saying is that every freaking thing you put in that form is going to potentially trigger something with respect to how they use this this we're really it's mining right it's what they're That's, doing it's called data mining exactly yeah. and actually if you read the fine print which no one ever does on forms the really really small words next to your signature at the bottom that say this data could be utilized for anything that's the stuff that they're collecting through their cognos reports and those reports they have for as someone who asks government for statistics they have these for years so they they have this data already and it's getting even more refined as they start finding the different characteristics and the it's being able to disaggregate the data based on different you know sections and that's you know a big driver of their mm -hmm. their new approach and yep. you know the scary part is though what if that data was based on bias and racism and things yep. that have just existed since time? What if there was, you know, there is actually a, a fundamental change in that country or in our, you know, government relations with them or in the economic situation? How is that reflected in the new data moving forward? And who's the gatekeeper of that data? I think that's a lot of stuff that we're going to have to unpack moving forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And let's pull up the third, because I think the third one's really interesting too, because this idea of okay. bins. So okay. door number three, here we go. Door number three. Okay. And this is just an example of, of binning. But what happens is when an application gets in, not only are there tiers, which we talked about, but they're also put into bins. And what bins are, are specific and this is all done by automation by the way so this is not like a specific officer going in there being like yes no maybe it's mm -hmm. the system filtering it but what you know about the bins though uh, and this is an example from again many many years ago in 2018 for, for 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 india is they split applications based on if they're not tier one if they're adverse we didn't share the screenshot but you know if you're uh, a minor child you're in one if you are um a third party national you're in a separate bin and those bins are all assigned to specific officers who are responsible for that type of case yeah. and what does that mean then if they are the ones dealing with the same type of case with similar facts and they have the chinook tool at their disposal yeah. what do you think is gonna happen 
bam, 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 bam. Same, same thing. Same results, over over. the same yeah. templates, the same. So the whole system is is done. I mean, from an efficiency perspective, I'm like, boom, I, I wish I had this in my, <laughs> you know, my own work. Uh, I would be able to do this so much quicker. But, you know, this is what immigration is doing. And I think as practitioners and as people going through the system, you need to know these this reality exists. Absolutely. I'm just going to jump back for a second here. Well, Sonny's saying your video is blurry. All right, Sonny, I think you joined a little bit late, my friend, but we'll go back here to the website. Go to here. This, that's just the nature of the images that we had that we're working with here. So um, this here is where you can access the entire blog with all of the uh, all of the overlays that we're pulling up here. So head back to Will's Vancouver Immigration blog and you will have the ability to see everything in bright clarity that you're seeking. <laughs> all right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I wanted to add one more thing that we've learned about tier one. I think I forgot to mention it earlier, but this is maybe also the reason, you know, some folks ask me, you know, I fit SDS, you know, student direct stream, or I fit some sort of category that should in theory expedite my case because I meet those requirements, be it mm-hmm. can plus. But one of the main things of tier one processing that we've learned, at least from some of our research is that the background questions all have to be negative in order for you to fit tier one. And if you've been previously refused, whew, you're wiped out. Right. Yeah. So you're it, instantly. It, it, yeah. You can't, yeah, it, you got any negative history with immigration. You're, you're not going to fall in here and and you can see, Will, how, and I don't mean to cut in here, but this is, people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, Oh my goodness. So it's in my best interest not to say anything about my prior refusal. Right. That's what people are going to be thinking in their head, which is like insane. So mm-hmm. clearly that is not what we're saying in any way, shape or form. Definitely, definitely not. I think it's more that some facts are just going to be facts that we can't, yeah. I, until we fight the system to get them to, you know, have some oversight on why it's included. The reality is, you know, if you have previous refusal, it's going to be harder. If you're applying as a, as a larger family, it's going to be harder. There are these facts that unfortunately we can't change, but it's good to know that when you're heading into the game. And I think that the one important thing that this highlights too, is that first application is so important, right? Um, once you get refused you, your first chance and your first sort of going through the tiering, you're probably going to be tiered the other direction in the next and following applications. So too many times we deal with folks who've started with some sort of sketchy agent or somebody who doesn't know what they're doing that can really lay uh, the negative foundation, so to speak, for, for future yeah. plans. So that's, you know, find yeah. someone reputable to start, pay an extra little bit of money to start. It'll save you a lot of heartache at the end because yeah. reapplications, the refusal rates is a huge negative curve. You're going to be down to very, very low by the third and fourth time you try. Yeah. And you and I, we I know we talked about this in our previous <laughs> videos, but one issue that I struggle with all the time is that they, People come to immigration lawyers when everything else has gone south, when their Mm -hmm. applications are are rejected, when there's problems, you know, then they come to us. And when I started practice, Will, I could fix everything. I had someone that I could talk to. There was officers uh, that had a lot more discretion. Senior officers would actually stick around for a while in their portfolios. You know, Mm -hmm. virtually everyone we worked through you know, worked with during, you know, um, with the CBA through 2020 during the height of the pandemic, they've all been transitioned off to new portfolios. And so you just don't have that legacy officer who just has the, you know, that, that, well, I can't describe it anything more than legacy information, that background, that experience to say, oh yeah, okay, I I really should give this person the benefit of the doubt because I know, you know, I've got enough experience to, to be able to base that. But now, like you said, if people, when they come to us, you know, we're far less likely to be able to, to fix things than if they even spend a little bit of time with us at the beginning stages to get some direction and guidance. Ultimately, if they choose to hire us or not is another thing, mm-hmm. but just a little bit of support and, and advice and direction at the front end can, can just drastically uh, change the, the, you know, the yeah. outcomes on the back end. I, I think this is interesting, just your story of like, practicing earlier days. And for me, even though it's, you know, it hasn't been so many years, but the stories I, I was told by those who practiced in the eighties and in nineties, I believe, and maybe a little bit before, but they would fly out to visa offices with a pile of their own application. I don't know if you heard, have you heard these stories too, Mark? Oh, maybe, yes. I don't know if you heard, 
and they wasn't would be me. the one. Wasn't me. I'm not <laughs> quite that old. I'm not quite that old, yeah. but okay. yeah. But they, they would be actually telling the visa officer in the meetings at these overseas visa offices to the officer, which ones of their files they would say were the yes, no, and the maybe. Can you imagine the ethical dilemma now and like how the law society would say about something like that? But that was what immigration was back in the day. It was literally that conversation of you telling your like the, the officer your own yes, no, maybe pile. And now it's the complete opposite where the officer themselves you know, I don't even know if they have ultimately the full discretion anymore because of the way the systems are setting up their yes, no, maybe files. Yeah. Yeah. Here's a question. Uh, we've got this going to LinkedIn, to YouTube, wow. to Facebook. So, and even Twitter out there, I know, but this is a, a LinkedIn. Uh, I don't have the actual individual here, but they said, so the, uh, as the use of, of AI is, you know, starting in its earlier stage, it will learn with time. Don't you think? meaning identifying issues of fairness, bias, and so forth. So what this this user, and I don't know who it is, maybe it's a government officer or something, but uh, the, the question is, well, it's going to get better over time as it learns, right? Isn't that the whole nature of machine learning is that it, it adapts and learns and improves and gets better and more precise? Well, I think, I think that's also the, the theory behind minimal viable product. So the idea that you put out something minimal first, and I think the CBA has even commented on that in the context of, I think, authorized rep, put out something first, and then you kind of consult your way into a final product. Um, the question is becomes about the foundations though, right? And I think this idea that it'll be better tomorrow can't always be used as an argument when you have foundational principles and biases that have existed for so long and you're not dealing with them on the front end. And maybe don't even have the right people in the room because i do know that the main drivers of this program are folks whose number one goal is process quicker get as much done as possible expedite uh, the, the files as, as quick as, as you can if that's your primary goal i think some important secondary goals for us primary goals fairness equality are always going to take a bit of a back seat so yeah. that's why we believe on our end as advocates and we've spoken about this in parliament recently that having a front end oversight, independent oversight, expert oversight that includes academics, that includes those who, who know about the, the racist history of immigration, the, the bias, the can be part of the conversation early on, not just at the end when they need a check mark from them. Yeah. And I better clarify when I talk and people only catch parts of the things that I say. So this is from Mark Gillanders. He says, should you not be honest on the refusal and address the concerns that were raised by Chinook and the officer? Hell Yeah. Yes, that's what we're saying. Absolutely. You never, ever want to misrepresent anything because you're not hiding it. They know it's all in the system. And with the information sharing that we have with at least four countries, at least four, we know that they can get access to everything. And even, even if they didn't, you never want to submit an application in any way, shape or form that is not fully disclosing because the consequences, well, it's the sledgehammer squashing the mosquito. So yes, Mark, 100%, just to clarify. <laughs> and also just like the second part of his comment that being direct with the Chinook refusal, like I think, especially in reapplications now, it's not simply good enough just to reapply and, and, nope. and, and, and say that there's a difference. The officers are actually asked to look into um, what is the difference? Because like, again, we actually learned now that at least in India and in different visa offices, it might be a different practice based on size, but the same officer is not supposed to look at the same application twice. So if they refuse it the first time, it goes to another officer. And that officer has to decide, was there anything fundamentally different from that last application to this one, a change that allows them to render a different decision. They actually have to justify that, right? Yeah. So if you ignore Chinook altogether and, no, and ignore the refusal reasons, you really haven't put that in front of the, the new officer to, to, to render that decision. We talked, I'm just going to flip back here to the fact that if you've got any negative refusals, it bumps you out of tier one in the past. And we've got a question here from Andy uh, Rodriguez, and, and Andy's a consultant, I think, in Ottawa. He says, does it mean that ATIP requests and JRs will be less effective under the AI era? Maybe we're jumping That's ahead here, Will. Yeah, hi Andy. I think I engage with you uh, quite often on on Twitter and other on our other medium as well. Um, no, this is a really really good question because uh, and actually I don't think I discussed it in my last podcast, but we've learned, for example, that the ATIP folks are actually being instructed by the subject matter experts to scrub things such as the um, risk indicators and the word flags out of the GCMS notes that we see as applicants. So 
the lawyers themselves from Department of Justice may be able to see it, but we can't see it as, as applicants because they're 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 not even not even scrubbed out. They're they're actually just like omitted. So it's not even that there's like a black you know redaction that you could say, oh, there was something there. We don't even know if there was something no. there, right? No. So that that's actually very problematic because it's like almost you know what we have and what you know the government might have is very different documentation. Um, same with bins. The bins triaging is hidden. But in the future, I think here's what Department of Justice is trying to do. They're trying to get the court to start to green light and support. Uh, and we saw it with Ukraine, and we're seeing in cases now, other decisions where, for example, travel history, trying to justify that travel history can be a refusal ground or try and justify that family ties can be a refusal ground. So if they find the right cases and bring them to decision and they get the judges on board, it could make judicial review very difficult in the future. That answer key might get to a point where it's so good that it's yeah. not penetrable by judicial review. And that's a scary thought for sure. That, that's super scary. Um, I want to just flip to um, one other question here. And uh, this it's maybe it's a question. I think it is. <laughs> so, so the refusal reasons um, on the letter and the GSMS notes are almost the same. And generic yeah. because of Chinook, they're saying here. And sometimes I have to decipher this from the comments. It's not so easy to type really fast, yeah. hoping your question gets asked. So we're trying to decipher this. Yeah. So applicants are unable to get any real reasons of rejection. Will this change when it comes to tree log? I think it's triage, probably, yeah. the word. Um, yeah. So, yes. So, again, the visa officers, as, as we've discussed in the past, they are not encouraged to diverge from the Chinook language, the template language, when refusing. They don't want to see too much personalized, factualized information that could open up channels of attack. Although, ironically, the court themselves have been critical being like, if you don't actually put those facts, how can you reach that reasonable outcome? Um, but I do think that with triage, what they will start doing, and this is why the theory of the Chinook being eventually replaced, I think they'll take aspects of Chinook they like, like this wonderful refusal answer key, but a lot of the other stuff will be replaced by this advanced analytics. Like if you think about it, other parts of Chinook, the other, um, what's it called? The other modules of Chinook aren't necessarily needed if advanced analytics takes over. It's just the reasons. And if the advanced analytics can get smart enough, develop neural networks, deep networks to actually think like an officer and apply those reasons and match it with the similar type Chinook thing, but with better language, with the court support, I think you're going to see less and less transparency, less and less actual factual analysis. Yeah. So in the beginning, I, I posed a question to you. I said, all right, um, you know, what's their big issue with pulling the curtain back and, and mm -hmm. you know, providing the, the actual methodology, how they're creating these, these, um, these various uh, uh, predictors, I guess you could say. And uh, so, so uh, this individual says, do we now know the key words to avoid getting Chinooked? <laughs> <laughs> that and that's such a, what a wonderful question and that's been the conversation by the way my baby just pulled open the awesome door. bring him on you might see? get a special bring her on as Miranda. I'm, I'm doing a podcast on um, <laughs> it's, all, it's all good all hey right, this is a live good. video man this is a this live is, video this okay is a, you know what this is half of the time <laughs> the whole world will see us babe. we don't want the whole world to see us babe. all right um <laughs> So half, of the time, well, one, well, half, half of the time, my, my dog hops up on my lap and then goes over to the window because apparently my window facing the street is the only window that he loves to look out. And it's always when I'm live. So I hear this scratching, <laughs> this scratching on the door. <laughs> my, my spouse opened the door for her. So I will. <laughs> anyways, all good. Um, so keywords to avoid getting Chinooked. I think that's a really interesting point because we don't know what the local risk, uh, local word flags are. We don't know what the risk indicators are. And the government, for all intents and purposes, doesn't want to release any of these, right? Because this could be sort of the uh, integrity of the system uh, becoming subject to you know, concern. Although in some cases, if we know something's anti-fraud, why not put it out there in, in another perspective, right? If you want to dissuade people or this employer is issuing fake letters, I think there's some benefit into the public knowing so that, you know, the people don't go to the same school or the same people to get the same letters, right? Yeah. But I think the, the key question now is as practitioners, you know, we write these wonderful letters trying to convince the officer and they convince the courts they're effective. But what if we accidentally drop or you know, in part of our practice, we're dropping the wrong word, like refusal or like, you know, yep. divorced or, I mean, and, mm -hmm. but at the same time, those are factual words. Those are words that exist on the, in the facts, right? So we're, 
yep. we have to address them. So yeah, it's putting, it's a really interesting future. Do you say more or say less? Yeah. And if you oh, say less, the court's going to say you said too little. Yeah. So here's the natural question. These are awesome. We have some phenomenal people watching right now who are asking really hey, good Garvey, questions. I know, I know Garvey, by the way, Garvey's a follower. Yeah. Garvey and I've been connecting. Good to see you, Garvey. Mm -hmm. Look forward to working so, with you. Um, so, st study, yeah. so what's the importance? And Will, this is also going to be spun out onto the Canadian Immigration Podcast as well. So sometimes I'll try to read yeah. these out. So Garvey says, what's the importance of a detailed study plan? statement of purpose or justification letters and study permits in this era of AI. So if things are scrubbed and they're looking for keywords and, and uh, officers even in the world of Chinook are maybe not even seeing everything, um, mm -hmm. you know, what role do they play? So my current theory is the knock two, knock three times theory, meaning that even though I know it may even hurt well, if someone's been refused already, I think the system's already triaged them differently into like a, a, a no or maybe category. I know the officer might not read the whole thing, but I have to prepare it as if it's going to go in front of a court or go in front of the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice is going to argue, regardless of whether the visa office said, you know, include only one page in your study plan, or if the visa office said, or, or even if the, the new portal only allows, you know, two megabytes per upload. When I go to court, I'm sure their argument's going to be insufficient evidence, not enough, too short, vague. So I don't want to leave any of those things up to debate or question. So I'm packing that application if it's been refused previously. I'm packing it with everything, a, a strong summary, but everything that I think I need to make my case with in court. And I'm finding that the, what happens after, if it gets refused, it goes to court, it settles pretty quickly because they know there's evidence and Chinook doesn't match up and I know the law. Then it goes back to a proper officer for review. And once they have all that information in front of them, it's really hard to refuse yep. a yep. case. I mean, it, it's doable, but it's it, it becomes difficult because if you have credibility concerns, you have to interview. And if yep. it's not insufficient of evidence, you know, what is your counter to them saying that or them providing evidence of this, right? So yeah, um, yeah exactly. Okay, so Gagging Deep, we just keep drilling down, Will. And uh, yeah. <laughs> so the next question from Gagging Deep says, um, what would this mean um, for previously refused applications? Will it be, will that be included in, in the high risk, even though the profile is clearly approvable? So this is obviously subjective. You say, well, this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, yeah, it was a refusal, but it was, a, 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 and maybe it was an error or there was something wrong, but on the system, it still says refusal. So then I'm getting triaged into tier two, maybe at best, maybe, you know, definitely not tier one. But so the question here is, how do we work around that? You know, mm -hmm. and I don't know if we have an answer. Well, yeah, it's a very difficult question. And I think also the one thing I've learned is yet yeah, we have to be a, a, attuned to the larger visa office pressures or right now we're in backlog period right so there i think the instructions are get rid of as much as you can as quick as or, or as eventually get rid of everything in the backlog which could mean a lot of refusals coming through the pipeline but there was a period of time i don't know if you benefit from that period of time too but it went from i think it was like right after the travel restrictions started to ease up a bit where they had refused a lot of very good applications out of offices like india and or out of delhi out of uh, Ankara and some others, and then they started approving a bunch of them on reapplications, right? And is that more though just guidance from the office to be like, listen, even though some of these might have previous refusals, times have changed. Let's open the door a bit. Yeah, let's and, soften you know, things up a little bit. Yeah, we don't want to be we, we don't want to yeah. to show our our blanket refusals as as, as something too blatant, you know? <laughs> exactly. But if but in times like these, you know, these offices could say any tier three, just I mean, without saying it directly, because that could better discretion let's yeah. get rid of uh you know those applications so yeah yeah it's a, it's a, it's an it's an interesting time and i think that you know a tipping the guidance and seeing how those program officers the senior ones are directing traffic is going to be sort of mm -hmm. giving us a big window on the future uh i love mark's question what happened to transparency yeah so uh, that's actually so, so that's what mark <laughs> so so mark gillinders comes back and he says what happened to transparency yes and yeah. and it's interesting will because you know when you look at uh one of the things we have not yet talked about is whether or not they're they're given marching orders in terms of of, of approval volumes, approval numbers, rejection numbers, keeping mm -hmm. the percentages at a certain level. They can't approve everyone. 
if they had, uh, you know, if they had a million study permit applications and every one was perfect, they were yeah. 23 years old, you know, single, yeah. they've got a yeah. billion dollars in their bank account, all this kind of yeah. stuff. The reality is the country just can't, well, okay, I'm, I'm making some generalizations here, but yeah. not everybody can come. Like there's there's 100%. limited capacity. So. 100%. <laughs> And actually, interesting enough, I've seen a couple, I, I, I don't, I think it was a fly board or one of the companies that put out some sort of uh, uh, statistic. They were talking about how in uh, Western Europe, uh, the demand or the high, like some of the highest increases in applications percentage wise have been from like Western Europe and countries that are VESPA. And we talked about VESPA, 95, 96% approval rates, right? So well, maybe easier. you could just, for those who've heard VESPA for the first time, could you just okay. kind of shed a little bit of light on what, what we're talking sure. about here? One, one, okay. So visa exempt study permit applications, essentially the government has a secret program. They haven't released publicly the information. <laughs> you can search up VESPA, VESPA, but the actual operations aren't detailed. But what it does is essentially automates the approval process for folks from visa exempt countries. We don't know the full list now, but we suspect it matches the original VESPA list and probably expanded because of the number of visa exempt countries. But the discrepancy between approval rates for those folks versus even SDS or, of course, you know, Africa, um, they're, they're mind blowing. It's literally 96% of VESPA countries from the ones I looked at in 2020 were approved, right? So for those folks, and again, I have questions, right? Because what makes yeah. someone from one of those countries, you know, their, their study plan, or they don't have to present yeah. any of this really, right? Well, they don't have well, to actually. So. Right. Well, well, we'll look at this. Okay. So you've got a 55 year old who decides they're going to go to study in Canada and they're from England uh, compared to a 55 year old who's looking to study from India. Right. Yeah. And is it purely, they've got all of those predictors, all of those things, that, you know, potentially that would kick them out of tier one, but because they're, coming from you know one of these vespa exactly. countries they basically it's like a double standard and it, it uh, is and even, i'm glad you <laughs> caught that and vespa doesn't seem to have any i mean i think they have a filter on country of residence so if you're not actually living in the country that you're applying from in vespa they, they flag you out but there's no flag there for age from what i've seen there's no flag for mature students so uh, and you know from those if those folks are coming to canada in an increased demand and the system can automate their approvals are they going to spend more time approving those folks and the numbers going to be packed up with that? Or are they going to be spending time reading through your, you know, like you said, your 55 year old Indian applicant to try and understand the purpose of why they're studying now? It's, it's easier to prove the VESPA. The system does it for you. Right. So um, that's the unfortunate reality. Like you said, limited spots from the targets that they put out, more demand from other countries where there's expedited processing and those that are going to suffer are folks that are racialized folks, mature student folks with families from, you know, global South countries. And that's the, I mean, I'm not okay with it. And I think that there's things yep. we have to unpack about it, but it's also like immigration has been very much founded on this, this type of discrimination historically and, and to today. Yeah. I uh, cheat on LinkedIn also says, how do, how do you challenge these refusals? Should you JR or should you request to reconsider? And, and just, I'll come back to that question. That's kind of the lead in. But then we've got individuals, and there's a number of these, but I'll pull up just you, Tanush, who says, my wife's visa was rejected because of some same reasons, no ties, home country, blah, blah, blah. Wondering, should I reapply or try something else? I'm going to push you. I'm going to do this. Do you hear that? That means you slide over here <laughs> to this. If you're watching live and you click on Will's contact Will and team at Heron Law Office right here. So this is why we're here. So when it comes to specific questions like this, what do I do? That's not something neither Will nor I will touch in the context of a live stream, but absolutely book a consult and we can at least give you a little bit of direction. But back to cheating here. So yeah. I, I do want to flag though, please contact Mark from now until July because I'm not actually <laughs> back in the office until July. I'm trying to take a, a vacation, which is weird because every time I come on what? one of your shows, Mark, everyone asks me for, for consultations afterwards. But okay. this time I'm 
<laughs> this, this time I'm, I'm, I know what is vacation, but I actually, you know, right now it's, it's something that's a high priority is to get some rest and I've been doing way too much writing. Uh, understood. Like, understood completely. Um, so if we so go find Mark until July and after July, um, <laughs> I, I there's, probably there's, there's our site here. So absolutely book a consult. And I know Leisha is actually, oh, well, wonderful. she's, she's taken July and she's going on a cross Canada tour in this camper van that her and her husband bought and they're taking the girls and and she's going to kind of work remotely because hey we we're a completely virtual firm so it doesn't matter and she's going to have some fun with her family i know i've got big plans i'm heading to pei in july with my wife for our for our 50th birthdays man we're That's old wow. Wow. We're old people. Congratulations. <laughs> and, uh, I love, your, love that your team is virtual. And like, yeah. And people. Chanel yeah. in Toronto, she's very quickly becoming our study permit expert. So lots of choices Wonderful. if you can't find yeah. the man, the myth, the legend. All right. <laughs> we try. We try. <laughs> I, okay. It's hard to even call myself a legend now when I'm, I'm getting refusals every single day. But, that, you know, I just, hey, like hey, I said, that, normalize refusals. Normalize refusals. Exactly. Yes. So, so back, to the, back to the question. You know, and all we can talk about this when it comes to what do we do when we get a stupid refusal? Yeah, do you, you know, yeah. do you do you Every request day. reconsideration? Do you do you consider mm-hmm. JR? Because I know many people I've spoken to, many counsel, they when they're yeah. quoting their study permit fees, they're 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 quoting, they're building in. Hey, understand yeah. this is probably going to get refused, and we'll need to judicial review it. So that's why I'm quoting yeah. you X dollars. They're they're actually yeah. building in the review. You know the so appeal. I've I've been debating it. I, I don't build it into my own retainers because I actually like I want to give the client the the idea, and I still think that we're getting yeah. the best shot. But I absolutely yeah. always talk about the judicial review and saying, you yeah. know, based on this case and fact pattern, like we're definitely going this route. I mean, I, as much as I like to say, and this is what's going to look like, and what it might look like in the back end here, are my costs. Um, but I, I think the good question here is like, you know, reconsiderations become very, very difficult recently. And I, I think a lot of people have had similar experiences, unanswered reconsideration requests are yep. being much stricter. They're applying the test actually properly now. Um, and they're saying that you just disagree with my finding as opposed to, I made some sort of procedural fairness error or, you know, something of that nature. Um, and sometimes they'll just bolster their reasons, right? But again, if you have the right leverage, like if a school institution wants to help you, or if you know you got someone looking it into you, for you, and there's actually a strong major factual mistake, it could be the, still the, the best route for you. Um, but for many of my cases now, it's either judicial review or reapplication. And my assessment of a new client that walks in the door is whether to JR or reapply. If I feel like they put everything forward and there's no holes, there's no argument for insufficiency of evidence, there's no, you know, everything has been, every T has been crossed, every I has been dotted, let's go to judicial review. If, if there's something where I think fundamentally an officer could have reasonably refused, and if we get the rule nine reasons or eight tip back mm-hmm. and we say, you know what, even though I would have maybe said differently, it, it's still reasonable, uh, I, I think that that's, um, that's a case that um, a new application might be better for but yeah. even the courts are overwhelmed with judicial reviews i don't want to give anybody any misunderstandings even for judicial reviews if you get reopened it goes to a new officer for reconsideration some cases they go straight to passport request a rare number and that's obviously those cases shouldn't have been judicial review in the first place a lot of them get a request for further information from the visa from the visa office saying you you know you pursuant to judicial review here's a new opportunity to send documents but a, a large portion of those cases are actually still sitting and they, and they're still in the triage and they're still waiting for an officer to review many, many, many months later. And that's unfortunately the reality of the system too. Yeah. And uh, your, your buddy here, Garvit also, he, he brings up probably what he's already talked with you about is the, the folks in December, the December refusals uh, reapplying in April and now are starting to get uh, um, yeah. Approval. Uh, and you know, obviously yeah. this is a very generalized statement. He says, Hey, Will, and thanks for answering here in India. I've seen many applications refused in December of 2021, getting approved in April, just by reapplying with a change study plan or statement of purpose. And you know, it's never that mm-hmm. simple, but, but, mm-hmm. but clearly there's, there's, you know, things that are happening here when they see trends of mass refusals and they're like, Whoa, yeah. we better, we better deal with this. Are yeah, they banking on people not challenging Will? Like, are they, yeah, are they, think, are they, are they kind of, uh, you know, evaluating the risk and saying, okay, you know, we don't think there's a significant risk people are going to challenge. So we're just going to refuse these. 
Yeah, I, I think that that's definitely an underlying portion of Chinook, the idea that if we can save our time and people will go away and, you know, they don't have, you know, because I think, I mean, in reality, if someone went on a very detailed factual analysis of your case, I'm sure, and if you did a good job on it, I'm sure they would slip somewhere because they would make a mistake in their finding or it open up an easy challenge. And the idea of Chinook is you kind of give this kind of vague, you know, purpose of visit, uh, doesn't justify costs don't make sense and hope that they go away right yeah. um the other thing i would say though is you know timing is also really interesting and something that i think we need to study more too and i, I understand like for december especially if a lot of folks are you know starting um class in january and it's last minute you know maybe that these offices saying to refuse and then if you know and that's another thing maybe you need to apply earlier now with the way that things are going right because if you're applying too soon to the start of when you want to go to class or when your purpose of visit it gives them reason to also refuse right so yes. um but this what is the visa office directing are they saying refuse first these are all things i think we have to you know yeah dig draw more down into. to absolutely mm -hmm. um this is something that actually, they said, I've missed the beginning of the discussion. This is Jigel. What applications are assessed by the AI system? Yeah. We actually haven't talked about that. So yeah, it's a great transition to also express entry the area that you're the mm -hmm. guru at too as well. Yep. So we know now for advanced analytics, they're moving into almost every category. So it started with like, Temporary residents, but now we know study permits, we know it's extensions, we know it's seasonal agricultural workers program, we know it's express entry, we know it's family sponsorship. That's a big one they've been doing, the advanced analytics for family sponsorships, mm -hmm. speeding up those who are inside Canada applying, which another questionable sort of decision as to, you know, if you speed up inside Canada and consider those low risk, are you encouraging more inside Canada applications by extension? Are you hurting those overseas applicants? Uh, but the express entry one is really interesting. And I think maybe I'll turn it over to you, Mark. Like if, if you think about yeah. yep. the triage model I discussed, like how would that fit into your understanding of express entry and how it works? Yeah. Yeah. It would not surprise me in the slightest will. You know, express entry is so, um, uh, it's so compartmentalized now that there is very, very little room for an officer's independent uh, assessment. You know, maybe in the context of I can't get a reference letter and I've got these other documentation or I have self-employed work experience, I could see instantly those situations bumping out of a tier one approval. Mm -hmm. But the rest of the stuff, like it's, you, you can see, you know, are the documents there, the initial intake assessment, you know, if you've got it, um, I could easily see that helping with the processing of applications to expedite them and get them moving forward. And for all intents and purposes, well, maybe they're using it right now. It's in, it's entirely mm -hmm. possible. Um, yeah. That's that's something that you know I've kind of been musing about right now because um, mm -hmm. they've got you know. And then the I'll bring it up. I'll bring it up. Okay, <laughs> and I know people are asking. Like I don't. What was it? The Toronto Star article or whatever it was about mm -hmm. the, the dreaded massive cull of applications. A return back to the conservatives' mass. You know, return of federal skilled worker applications. Personally, I can't see a world where that would happen, but people are starting to ask it. And, uh, mm. you know, of course, when I talked with the minister, um, everything's on the table, <laughs> right? Yeah. And when, yeah. when people say that, you know, obviously certain things are given a whole lot more weight than others, but it's scary for people. Really, really scary, especially when, when, yeah. when they've been sitting in the queue and they look at 27 months processing and yeah. then wondering, I've sat through this for how many years and now... Is it, you know, are they going to reject my application? Which I am going to go out and I'm going to say, no, I don't see that happening in any world. But, yeah. Yeah. Well, of course, I, I think advanced analytics gives them the tool to be quicker at the bulk decision making. And if they, I don't think they're going to do it all in one big go. But, you know, many cuts of uh, a pizza still eventually eliminate all the slices, right? So, um, sorry, that's a weird metaphor I should put together. No, but no, anyways, yeah. um Tier, here's what I think is going to come up with express entry. And maybe this is just me putting crystal ball, crystal ball. Yeah. We know express entry. They're starting to think, especially with FSW, I think they're going to start going occupation based, yep. right? They're going to start it's built into the budget. Folks. They've already built in, built into the budget. Yep. The, the NOC system is switching to the tier system, right? We know the training, education, experience, and responsibilities, which further kind of disaggregates the data. We know that they're using advanced analytics and they have all this data now and they're they're tracking they're seeing you know 
I mean, different things, the stats can, the long-term impact of folks in different areas. They're trying to use data to drive now what express entry looks like in the future. And I think a lot of the advanced analytics is going to be used so that they can triage folks if you're in healthcare, if we need you quicker than the other folks in, in, at this time, we're going to speed up your applications. And I think I may have seen a bit of that during um, COVID too, where I, I had a yeah. couple of folks who were in the medical field or in, in, in government type roles and there's express entry record time, like a week. Zip, like, zip, something, zip, zip. And yep. something must have triggered something in that system to pull that file out. Yes. So yes. I think you're yep. absolutely right when uh, that those are the things that they're working towards. Yep. Absolutely. I think it's I think it's just a matter of time. Anything where you've got high volumes, very replicable decision making processes, um, where there is, you know, we're, I don't know, maybe you can speak for yourself, but I'm not seeing a, a huge, huge um, likelihood that they're going to roll it out for H and C applications. You know, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Anytime mm-hmm. soon, like we're not there. But but the ones that that relatively um, you know, are, are, are compartmentalized into very, very uh, specific, narrow, you know, document requests that have really uh, trackable and measurable parameters. You know, those are things that they can feed all in, right? And uh, uh-huh. yeah, uh, the reason I pulled this up, Will, was I don't see anything about refusals on here. Yeah, and that's actually, it was going to be something I was going to say. Like, right now, they're automating the eligibility findings of tier one approval cases but we know from the policy playbook that irc has put out their internal sort of where they want to go with advanced analytics and ai they are very much openly discussing automating refusals right and that's a very very different system than automating approvals because the idea with this automating approvals of eligibility means a at the end of the day admissibility review still there's a human officer somebody's going to look at it but what if that somebody gets removed or that somebody you know, especially gets removed for cases where it's automatically refused. I mean, that's another whole layer. And what does that process look like? And I think there's a reason we haven't seen that chart, so to speak, so far. Yes. Here's an interesting one. And we're just about out of time, you guys. So we've, we've gotten to a lot of questions. And I think we've, you guys have helped us to drill down quite a bit more. Um, but this is, uh, this is an interesting question, just to clarify for people what this is. So Gurpreet says, recently I heard someone got approval with a fraudulent document, but was refused entry by CBSA. Is the Chinook system not taught to check authenticity of documents? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, is the answer. <laughs> do you want to spell a little bit more out on this? Now, it's probably yeah. more than likely someone tipped off immigration and that's how CBSA got word and then caught him at the port of entry. But Will, what are your... Yeah. Well, the, still the risk flags and, and those fo- things have to be, uh, unless they're you know entered in by the system, so, someone's got to see this trend and, and provide it, right? So the fact that, they, that, that they're not being caught, uh, it makes perfect sense because they may have not been flagged and it's, you know the, the system hasn't caught it. And again, remember Chinook is the, um, it, it extracts the data from the forms and puts it into an Excel system that helps display and has other data and other inputs to make it easier for the officer to do decisions. We still haven't talked about the actual documents and supporting documents themselves. What is extracting information from those documents? We think we have the answer. It's a word called harvester. Uh, I haven't, uh, we haven't gotten any tips back yet. We're researching. But my guess, and again, another prediction is they're going to start using OCR and other mechanisms to extract things from things such as statements of purposes and letters and translations and stuff into this system so the officer can or the eventual artificial intelligence officer can utilize those uh, as well to think about those when they're making decisions but that's a whole other ball game of work that the government is for sure doing uh it's just we don't have enough information yet to be able to speak too much about it yeah all right well, Will, is there any, any like obviously we've got a little bit of a teaser here because it's, mm-hmm. you know, and as I go back and I review your blogs as well, there's lots more that uh, the modeling and things that you want to talk about and write about as we, as we learn more about it, you know, um, those model rules in their various forms, the officer rules and the, uh, and, and the visa office rules and things like that play an integral component with this mm-hmm. in the initial triaging. Mm-hmm. But any any uh, little teasers or things that we can look for in the future if we pull you back here? 
Yeah, well, well the, the, thing, the great thing with this is we never know what part two and part three and part four looks like. It's kind of where the research trail uh, takes us. And, and, you know, I consciously made a decision that as much as I love practice and helping clients, a good portion of my time is also uh, dedicated to researching, presenting, speaking, and um, some would call troublemaking. Uh, you know, <laughs> I have to be very honest with you. This This kind of stuff, like if from a career progression perspective, I'm not making money off of it. Yeah. I'm spending a lot of time off of it. This is sort of a labor of love because I think the system can be better yeah. and I want it to be better for folks like me and like my parents who immigrated. Um, but, you know, it, it's it's digging deep into spaces where I'm not sure we are necessarily welcome. Uh, and you're going yeah. to see a lot of this information come out three, four years after it became relevant. Just like today, like we're talking new as in 2018 stuff yeah, that may look yes. different today, right? Yeah. Um, expect that to continue moving forward. And yes, you know, does AI processing breach principles of natural justice, more specifically procedural fairness? I think those who create AI are aware of the potential for that to happen. And it's a very fine line that they're walking. And similarly, as applicants, we have to not be afraid to argue that procedural fairness uh, can be violated mm -hmm. with systems that are not are not properly yeah. checked. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Well, thank you so much, Will. This was a great live stream. We had a great turnout, um, you know, and I appreciate everybody who posted questions. There was lots that we didn't get to and we'll definitely circle back and we'll, you know, we'll definitely bring Will back and, and uh, talk more as, as we learn more. And mm -hmm. like Will identified, you know, we are really playing catch up here and the government, I'll give them props. They have been, you know, they've, they've, uh, that black box, they've kept that black box pretty tight. And, uh, you know, we literally have to, to sue them to get information out of them. And in the course of litigation and a whole bunch of other things and, and uh, you know, every access point that we can, that we can target as immigration lawyers, that's what we're doing. So, you know, you mentioned at the beginning, Will, that, uh, you know, you don't consider yourself any kind of a, an AI expert. Well, did we consider ourselves travel experts, you know, border no. closure experts, um, we all learn you know, it. or, orders in council experts? Our practice evolves. It's super dynamic. Yeah. And this is the world, uh, this is the world that we're in. So it's, can I add one more thing, Mark, though? Please. Uh, just sort of catch off there. Um, mm -hmm. The parliament is looking into this. There's, there's been parliamentary committees on this work. Uh, the last two actually have been focused. Chinook has been dropped everywhere. Same with artificial intelligence. We have wonderful individuals, Professor Gideon Christian, uh, you know, advocating on behalf of uh, black, black Canadians and, and, and African migrants. And I think that as the way to show that we care about this is not to ignore the conversation, but engage in it and to ask our decision makers and hold them to account and say, listen, these are having some harmful effects. We know artificial intelligence can harm folks. Can you ensure that there's, there's oversight? Can you ensure that you're taking steps to consult with community, especially immigration lawyers? Like yeah. we we should have been consulted more on this. Yes. I continue to say this. Yeah. And I think moving forward, one of the great steps they could take is to open up a bit with us. You can put us behind closed doors. You can make us sign whatever you need to sign, but you know, at least give us a little bit more so that we can transfer that back to our clients and help promote the system integrity. Yeah. And and you know, I guess the last word I'll say is that this is the direction we're going. We're not going backwards. Right. Mm. And, and when, you know, the government is faced with these crushing volumes of applications, they have to figure out solutions. And this is one of the solutions that they are obviously they're invested in. It's our job to make sure that they do it in a very measured, a very well thought out um, and uh, much more transparent way. And I think that's what we're shooting for. So. Absolutely. All right. So lots of thanks from everybody. Um, and uh, thank you, Will. We will have you back again awesome. soon. Take care, my friend. Yeah, thank you so much. Thanks so much for the invite. Take care, everyone. Be safe. You bet. And I'm just going to slide over here and end with a word from our sponsor. All right. This episode of the Canadian Immigration Institute and the Immigration Nation is sponsored by Journey Business Plans. And I can tell you, over the years, I've spent a lot of time working with clients who just have no clue how to do a business plan. Well, Journey Business Plans is one of the most reputable and experienced immigration business plan companies that, that I've worked with. And, uh, you know, they, they work with people both in Canada and in the U.S. And, um, yeah, several business cases I've uh, referred to them. And for a simple flat fee, they quickly produce a professional business plan. Uh, they give, um, really, that 
when I look at when I look at what happened to my clients, the business plans that they generated for them really give them an edge compared to what they could have generated on their own. And I don't consider myself a business plan expert. So that application, uh, the, the application to journey to help them, to, to retain them, to help you with the development of your business plan is something that I highly recommend. Um, their expertise, responsiveness, and impressive turnaround and delivery time on immigration business plans is unmatched. Having an expertly written plan can make all the difference in an application, you guys. So whether you have an application for an intercompany transfer, a startup visa, a C11 significant benefit, self-employed, PNP, or any of the other business pathways, they will deliver a concise, convincing business plan that aligns with your immigration strategy. And remember, this isn't cookie cutter stuff. Each of these are tailored to you. So visit them today at www.journey, that's J-O-O-R-N-E-Y dot C-A. All right, thank you, Journey, the sponsor of this episode of Immigration Nation. Take care, everyone. We'll see you next time.